Excuse us. Pardon me, ma'am. Sorry, sorry. Move it, asshole. Oh, thank God. We got good seats. Damn right we did. So, we got the drinks. We got the popcorn. And the candy. I think we're ready, man. Hey, guys, sorry I'm late. The bathroom here is nuts. Oh, my God, you made it. Yeah. It's about time, Nathan. Damn. Shh. The movie's starting. I'm Nathan Simmons. I'm hungry. This apartment smells. This notebook is ridiculous. I hate everyone. God. And this is the Silver Linings Playlist, a podcast that tries to find the silver lining in some of cinema's bleakest endings. And fellas, we're back. We're back. We're back. A dinosaur story. <laughs> no one asked us to come back. Nope. <laughs> much like uh, much like Charlie in this movie, no one really asked him to be around anymore. <laughs> Jesus. I am exhausted. Yeah. Like, I knew it was coming. We got the Aronofsky tradition. Mm-hmm. But I, I, uh, what a what a film. <laughs> What a movie. What a way to kick things off. Start the festivities. What a what a fun way to start the season. <laughs> I woke up, made my coffee, and had to push play on this movie. <laughs> Same. <laughs> it's been a rough Sunday. <laughs> Great. Same. So, yeah, we're back, everybody. Uh, this is episode 157, kicking off season seven. Very apt. Wow. And, of course, like uh, Nathan mentioned, an Aronofsky movie, we have to do it. We have to. We have to. If this is your first time tuning into the show, what we like to do is watch movies such as The Whale, and we try to find the silver lining in that. Uh, Can we do- keep the tradition going post this season? Are I'm, we out of movies? I was wondering that too. I'm debating on watching Noah, <laughs> a rewatch of Noah, just to see if it fits. If not, uh-huh. I don't know, fellas. I don't know what we're going to do. I'll make an argument for Noah right now. Okay. Fucked up ending. Humanity survives. Continues. <laughs> It's not bad. It's not a bad idea to pitch Noah then. After this story, all that stuff happens to Jesus. Oh, mm-hmm. well, technically, Noah is a prequel to this movie. So there you go. Ed Black Swan <laughs> and everything else. That's true. Now, we have to revisit what we're going to do for season eight moving on. Technically, Noah is a prequel to everything. That's what I meant. Yeah. Fuck. Seen elsewhere. So everything <laughs> Noah takes place in that little in snow, snow globe, globe. <laughs> it all fits together. Uh, okay. So the well. Mm. Boy. What a movie. Nathan, first watch? Yes. I thought you were, I thought you were about to say, Nathan, this is your pick. And this I was going to say, how fucking dare you? <laughs> Nathan, you're the whale of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I've always said that. No, yeah, this this was a first watch for me. Same. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, well, how, how- I got a lot of shit going on, DC. <laughs> mm-hmm. I say as I've been unemployed for two months. <laughs> <sighs> How'd you guys take it in? Well, it uh, it's a tough sit. Mm-hmm. It's a thoroughly unpleasant movie. Mm-hmm. Not that I need every movie to entertain me, but I just... Did, uh, you, did you say thoroughly? I, I thought did. you said thoroughly, too. I did. <laughs> well, I, 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 verily, it did not entertain me. <laughs> well, Fat Thor, I thought, was got cut out of this movie in the sure. assembly cut. So <laughs> I think I would go so far as to say that I hated watching this movie. Wow. Wait, wait. Okay. Hated watching the movie or hated hated the movie. I think those are kind of similar okay. sentiments. I, I I severely disliked this film. Wow. <laughs> okay. Oh, we'll give it into it. Mally, first impressions? Uh, I mean, as a glimpse into Nathan's future, I love it. Oh, <laughs> sure. <Wow. laughs> We're starting. Okay. Yep. <laughs> We're back on track. Uh, this was a second watch for me. And oh, my actual opinion, it was fine. Okay. Mm. It is a hard watch. But I feel like that's pretty much all of Aronofsky's work. So that's kind of what I come to expect at this point. Sure. And I enjoyed it the first time and I enjoyed it the second time just as much. I, I think, I guess enjoy is not the proper word, but. <laughs> I was about to say, <laughs> you're like sitting there in like your whale t-shirt with your whale action figures. <laughs> um, I, I got, I got thoughts for sure. And mm-hmm. we'll get into like the more serious aspects of it. But mm-hmm. I, overall, I definitely. I think this is still a great movie. Hong Chao is amazing. She amazing. is. Amazing. She's good in everything. I Indeed. Agree. I was just talking to, to Nathan off off mic about how Hong Chao is such a versatile actor. Mm-hmm. Like, you compare this with the menu. Yeah, Watchmen. Yeah, oh, yeah. Watchmen. She is, She's amazing in that show. She is so able to just, like, dial into whatever the specific project is and disappear into that role. And, man... I got I got notes on uh, on Liz, her character as well, oh, yeah. but I'm sure we'll talk about it. Terrible nurse, terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I think you nailed it though in that the, the performances I think are pretty solid. Well, stellar. Most of the performances in this movie are stellar. Yes, mm-hmm. I think Aronofsky is. You know that Garth Marenghi moment where he's like, "I know some writers who use subtext, and they're all cowards." <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I think it's 
a quote that has been said many times on, on this, this show. show. <laughs> I think that's like the guiding star of this movie. Like yeah. there's so many moments in this where I was like, and it's funny because I keep seeing the 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 criticism of, well, you know, it's because it's based on a play. And I'm like, there are plays that are well written. Yeah. Like, what, <laughs> well, that's like when people like, because I don't like the hateful eight. And mm. it's like when people are like, well, you have to watch it like a play. Then make a fucking play. Yeah. Sure. yeah. <laughs> to that point, though, I the first time I watched this, I didn't realize it was based on a play until about halfway through. I'm like, oh, mm. we're not leaving this house. Right. And then on this rewatch, it's still, I think the pacing and the camera work and mm-hmm. especially the direction really like lend to, you know, taking away from that, uh, that idea that it's based on, like, it doesn't mm. feel like a, pl- like I watch fences and I'm like, oh, this is a play play. Like this is a play movie. <laughs> See, I, I felt like every character enters from left or right. Yeah, I felt I, like there's, there's so many moments in this where I, I, I felt like, yeah, I can see that this is a chamber play, but I, there, there are, there are some interesting artistic choices. And look, I'm never going to say Aronofsky is a bad director. It's, mm-hmm. it's a well directed movie. I just, I think most of my problems stem from the sort of just misery porn nature of the screenplay. Yeah. I definitely want to talk about that. I think, I think I just commit to it though. Like, same with Mother. Like, mm. I get it's just a niche concept mm-hmm. and like he's diving headfirst into that. Sure. And in this movie, I feel like he's doing the same with the, like you mentioned, like the entering from stage left, stage right kind of nature of it. But mm-hmm. I don't know. Like I said, I just commit to it. I buy into the story right away. And I think that, like I said, it goes to the camera work. It goes to the direction. Like, and the fact that it's four, three as well, mm. like, this house and Charlie fills up every aspect of it. Mm-hmm. And you see that in the frame. And I don't know. I think there's just a lot of little things that they're doing, both Aronofsky and uh, the DP. Is this Libertake as well? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think, I think they just are doing so much with so little mm-hmm. that I really appreciate the craftsmanship of it. I mean, that might be what leads into my real appreciation of this movie too, is just from a filmmaking standpoint of like, sure. Taking a play, sending it in this one place, and doing as much as you can with so little. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I just, I like I said, I commit to it right away. I, I buy in and God damn it, it was a fucking gut punch this time too, knowing exactly what's going to happen. I was still oh. <laughs> sobbing at my computer desk watching it. <laughs> yeah, there, there are moments that really, like, yeah, really struck me mm-hmm. and really hit me emotionally. But uh, yeah, like, the- well, I mean, yeah, we'll get into it as we go on for sure. All right. What were you going to say, Mally? No, nope, felt- nothing. I'll pick it up later. It was probably <laughs> something about me putting uh, jelly on a sandwich or something. <laughs> Man, I would kill for a sandwich mm. let's uh let's get into some of the details including the cast and the uh, the box office and all that for the whale for the first time here in season seven you think they'll deliver a pizza to my office window they might I, I would love if you ordered a pizza and then before the episode ends it got there like how great would that be for the episode 30 minutes or less baby <laughs> Dustin it seems like you're implying that throughout the season we will continue to check in on the whales box office I, I will I will you never know you never know they may do a re-release uh-huh that's true why not in IMAX <laughs> oh man Brendan Fraser as as this character in IMAX boy that's a lot okay I I, I kept thinking throughout the movie so his name is Charlie mm-hmm. but the thing that kept striking me during the Oscar ceremony was they kept referring to the character as the whale yeah. as though it was like a, a, a watchman character. Like Dude, was- <laughs> I can't wait until Brendan Fraser as this character shows up in Avengers Secret, Secret Wars. Wars. <laughs> That's gonna be amazing. To, to be fair, there uh-huh. is an entire scene. He just sits on Kang the Conqueror. <laughs> <laughs> there is an entire scene dedicated to pointing out that, hey, this guy's a lot like Moby Dick, right? <laughs> like, that is in the movie, so I... I- my- eyes the first time he started talking about moby dick my eyes rolled so hard that i thought i'd broken them i I think that's like minute five by the way Uh so your eyes broke real early they did they did (laughs) so the year is uh last year 2022 the director as we mentioned and of course as we start every season is darren aronofsky Mm -hmm. uh the movie stars brendan fraser sadie sink hong chow ty simpkin samantha morin and I can't pronounce this last name, so apologize. Sathya Sridharan. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't know. So, how far into the movie did you guys realize it was the kid from Insidious? Uh, oh, uh, just now. Yeah, the second uh, time he showed up, I was like, <laughs> "Hang on, why do I recognize him?" He's in Insidious and Iron Man Three. Right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, Mally. Before we, before you hopped on the call, I mistakenly called Sadie Sink Sarah Snook, and imagined <laughs> that movie instead. Sign me the. 
fuck <laughs> up. Oh my god. But it's just her character from Succession. That's Absolutely. what we were talking about, yeah. Absolutely. And she just comes over and just fucking rails on this dude. <laughs> and she really wants that 120,000. Yeah, I think we were thinking of her as more the Sadie Seat character or less the Hog Chow character, but now I'm liking that idea too. Oh, man. <laughs> Could you imagine Sarah Snook just yelling at him, chew your food like a normal person? <laughs> uh, that, that line. <laughs> so good. Uh, the budget was $10 million. Would this movie be better <laughs> if Charlie was played by Kieran Culkin in a fat suit oh and then oh and then you gotta make you gotta make uh Kendall Roy the the missionary right of course this is coming together (laughs) this ain't bad the movie grossed 55 million dollars worldwide it currently sits at a 64 percent on Rotten Tomatoes I think that's a little unfair I think it's a little too low Mm. but that's just me and the movie uh was uh uh, winning at the Oscars for Best Achievement in Makeup and Best Leading Actor, again, for Brendan Fraser. Mm-hmm. It was also nominated for Best Supporting Actress for Hong Chow. Should have won. Yeah. Who, did, who did she lose to? Jamie, Jamie, Lee, Jamie Curtis. Lee Curtis. Oh. Who, who wasn't even the Best Supporting Actress in the movie she was nominated for. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. Well, it's like, I'm all about Jamie Lee Curtis having an Oscar, but like, she won for that role. It's like I when know. Leo finally won his. Right. For The Revenant. Yeah. It's yeah. just, uh, we, we got to give it to you. And it's, it didn't Scorsese do the same thing with The Departed. Like, they finally gave him Best act, uh, best Director. And it's like. <laughs> they gave him Best Actor. That's, yeah, they gave him Best Actor, too. I mean, have you seen those eyebrows? Jesus. <laughs> That's how I feel about Angie Bassett getting her honorary Oscar. I'm like, get the fuck yeah, out of here. Give her that, a fucking Oscar. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I got a drink for the film, fellas. Mm. I thought that bit was done. Me, no. too. <laughs> well, it is, unless there's a reason to do it. And in this case, uh, I thought it is was. It, is it just all olive oil on ice <laughs> <laughs> it is not i thought it was apt because charlie drinks a lot uh drinks it a lot in this movie and that is of course a nice refreshing diet pepsi okay here we go that's disgusting and i'm not a huge fan of diet pepsi i don't mind regular pepsi but you did it for the bit I did even the though bit. we can't see you <laughs> exactly <laughs> okay. um, i i was raised in a coca-cola household so yeah, sir, uh, go kill yourself <laughs> i was raised in a sam's choice household we weren't fucking rich <laughs> an rc cola household over here so yeah no i will say i my babysitter my great aunt mm. uh she, she that was an rc cola house all right on it was great shout out to mally's aunt yeah. yeah, shout out, Bally's aunt. Great aunt. Should I, should I read? Is she still with us? Yo, yeah. No, okay. Aunt Patty. Yeah, that sassy bitch ain't never going to die. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to shout her out in the RIPs with Oatmeal and Donald Pleasants, but if she's still with us. I guess. Nah, she going to outlive all of us. Uh, okay, then. All right. Well, I'm going to sip on this nice, refreshing diet Pepsi while we uh, revisit the trailer, which, I, you know, Nathan and I were talking about this off air as well. <laughs> The marketing for this movie, uh, wow. What marketing? And, right, and that's a good call. I mean, this was one of the first COVID-affected movies in production, so I get it. But also, man, poster art is just a lost like a lost art Th- this <laughs> year we've just gotten so used to only seeing one screenshot from a film for like 10 months until <laughs> oh killer of the flower moon <laughs> right. oh my god this was that last year i saw someone make up the poster with that still image it was like they released the official poster and i was like god damn it <laughs> <laughs> all right fellas let's revisit the trailer for the whale Missed opportunity not using Say You'll Be There by Michael Jackson. (laughs) Jesus Christ. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so we're we're establishing that we're going to have a horror movie score in the trailer also. I was going to say we're establishing the John Carpenter school of things. Let's show you all the places we're going to (laughs) go or we have been. We'll talk about that in next week's movie, too. Mm -hmm. Do you ever get the feeling? People are incapable of not caring. An utter triumph. People are amazing. God fucking damn. I don't care. I don't care. It breaks me. Oh. No, he's... I, his performance is unassailable. Oh. I, I do. I do think Brendan Fraser is amazing in this movie. It's. It's. Uh, let, let's. Let's talk about Brendan Fraser right out of the gate mm-hmm. because... I get why people don't like this movie. Sure. Like, I really do. It, it, it is, to your point, Nathan, it is emotional manipulation. Mm-hmm. It is gratuitous. It is Oscar bait. It's all those things. But there is something in Brendan Fraser's performance 
that makes this movie special. Like, mm-hmm. I truly, with all my heart, don't think anyone else could have starred in this. And Aronofsky feels the same way. Not even Kieran Culkin? Not even James Corden? <laughs> I was going to bring up the James Corden thing. Kieran Culkin, I mean, we could discuss that to another extent, but <laughs> yeah, I, I, Aronofsky said himself he was trying to make this movie for like a decade, but couldn't find the right star. Right. And Brendan Fraser was the one to do it. And mm-hmm. without him... This whole thing falls apart to me. Him. Without him. And I I, I guess that's also sort of a slam on uh, all of the people who'd played this character on stage before. (laughs) No, well, I mean, there is a a difference between stage performance and... There is. There is. That's why I'm not a film actor. (laughs) I was going to say, just look at when the talkies first started. You have a lot of examples of that. Brendan Fraser running at the camera. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) And not only because Brendan Fraser is a great character, but because the story of Charlie, I found on this rewatch... Mm -hmm. Somewhat very similar to the story of Brendan. Oh, yeah. You have a happy guy that is like, he just has something absolutely horrific happen to him. And it alters the trajectory of his life Mm -hmm. to an absolute extreme. And through that tragedy, he overcomes so much, but he has to endure the weight of the world on him before he can. I mean, that's that's basically the hero's journey, but... Sure. I do feel like the movie sort of cops out of exploring that in any meaningful way though like there are we we he does tell us like okay my 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 lover killed himself Mm -hmm. and i we got to talk about the lover's name by the way alan (laughs) alan grant no it's not was was it grant it was grant i was like what if charlie just woke up from his ambient nap and would just saw a velociraptor going alan (laughs) Alan. (laughs) i mean uh uh raise this movie a star for me you know what i gotta put my uh premiere skills to 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 work after this (laughs) but we we're we're told that this happened to him but it's not ever really explored beyond that it's just this happened to me because of a trauma. I, I don't know. I, I don't know yeah. how if I'm like articulating this correctly. No, that, I, I get what you mean. I chalk that up to again. This is being based based on a play. Sure, and you can only do so much. One location. Like yeah. we want to stay here. Yeah, and I think the biggest thing I want to discuss with Brendan is I saw a lot of people when the reviews were coming out for this movie saying Brendan's back. This is his his comeback, his redemption. And mm-hmm. I'm like, I don't think redemption is the right word to use. No, he was wrong. Exactly. Yeah, because he doesn't need to redeem himself. And, and he has done things before this movie since he, you know, stepped back away from the limelight. Mm-hmm. But I think he chose this movie specifically because he saw something in Charlie that he saw in himself. Mm-hmm. And that is that Charlie is almost inhumanly and otherworldly empathetic. Yes. Like, he is kind. He is nurturing. I don't think he raises his voice in anger once in this movie. He, yeah. The, the only time he ever yells is when he's panicked. Right. Because he's being left behind. Yeah. And, and he takes the brunt force of this entire world just because of his daughter sure he is willing to kill himself if it means his daughter will have a better life yeah. and i know i saw after the fact a lot of people say oh this was a pity oscar that people that he you know he only got this because people felt bad i'm like no this dude fucking earned put in this the oscar yeah i agree there is a pain in brendan's eyes mm-hmm. not just as charlie but brendan himself in this movie that is one of the hardest things to see mm-hmm. like i see two people in in brendan's performance here and mm-hmm. it is I, i'm fucking tearing up now like i can't <laughs> i can't handle it it right. is that's that's what makes this movie for me if it was sure. anyone else i i think this movie does earn a 64 percent. so and I, I i agree with that i think the movie i mean the, the movie doesn't exist without this central performance right and i i just i think yeah i think that's what's so tough for me is that i do think he's phenomenal in this movie but i i feel like the things around him aren't given quite as much care or fine tuning yeah. um i i i found i found ellie's character to be almost unbearable to she to- is one of the worst people to ever exist <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is it's uh-huh I mean, Sadie Sink plays it perfectly, but sure. Jesus Christ, like, it's a lot. This character is the worst. Oh, man. And boy, what a bullet we dodged, but could have been with the whale, because as you uh, mentioned earlier, right. this movie was supposed to star James Corden, directed by Tom Ford. Boy, howdy. And I have, I actually liked Nocturnal Animals. I think Tom Ford has a visual flair mm-hmm. and a good directing style, but... There, you can't, you can't make this movie with James Corden. You can't. You just can't. <laughs> Absolutely not. No. Ugh. So, 
so I just want to get that out of the way. I I I love Brendan Fraser. Like a lot of people do. I'm so glad that he's back. Mm-hmm. But you know, I I watched this movie and then I listened to his his interview with uh, with Mark Maron, and it's indescribable the pain that this this guy feels. Mm-hmm. And you can hear it in his voice, even when he's trying to be optimistic and laugh and everything. Mm-hmm. It's earth shattering and like even mark himself in the interview was like crying and choking up at parts and it's just like jesus dude i i'm so glad he's back i'm glad this was his like first big piece of work that he done when he came back and i'm excited to see what he does next so yeah just figured we might as well get that out of the way because that was the elephant in the room <laughs> the whale in the room it does feel <laughs> oh God. it does feel like there are people who don't realize exactly what what happened right to to, to brendan and like well, I call him Brendan. We're we're buds, but oh, like, yeah, you're good. You're on good terms. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he writes <laughs> your, me. Your boys. Yeah, your boys. He's one of my guys. He writes me from the set of Doom Patrol, <laughs> and he uh, no, he's he he was sexually assaulted. Mm-hmm. He went through a divorce, slipped into a huge depression, was blackballed by several you know organizations yeah. because he spoke out about his, that assault. Yeah. And, and yeah, he, he's a guy who, much like Charlie in this movie, felt like nobody wanted him anymore. Exactly why I say he, he's the only one that could play this. Uh, yeah, no, he, he brings a very real pain to this performance. And I think that's why it works. And, and we should mention this is all pre Me Too as well. Oh, yeah. Like he, he started talking about it more because of the Me Too movement. And, and it's, it's got to be a slap in the face of like, you come out and you're outspoken about this happened to me. And then mm-hmm. like less than a decade later, mm-hmm. the tide shifts and it's like, well, what the, f-? and then you're still left on and by the wayside. Like, yeah. I, I don't know. Like I said, I, I watched this movie and I take all that in with this performance, which is why it just, it just works for me. So, and well, that being said though, the performance is so good that when things are like less subtle around him, mm-hmm. I think it, I, it hurts it a little bit. Like I, I think whenever he's like, chewing on a bucket of chicken and the sound is cranked up yeah. to 11 and the score sounds like freddy krueger just appeared in the boiler room like I, <laughs> like I can, it makes me i lose my i lose it a little bit so i i get i get your could i get your your complaints about it mm-hmm. and i i will admit again that this is des- like the score alone <laughs> is designed to be emotionally manipulative it's a hundred percent every score is that's sure. true but that's this true. one is like look at how disgusting he is exactly. don't you sh- shouldn't you hate him and i'm like i what do you what do you want me to think movie <laughs> that's a good point because a lot of people again pointed out that this movie is very fat phobic which i don't i don't know i don't know how you feel about that i can't speak from experience i've been overweight but i've never been obviously this obese right and I don't know, I I don't want to speak out of turn, but to me, I don't see it as, look how disgusting this guy is, he's Mm -hmm. so pathetic. I see it as, especially with Charlie's character, Mm -hmm. and I don't mean like the character of Charlie, but his actual character, Mm -hmm. like, again, he is the kindest person to maybe have ever existed on film, Mm -hmm. and if nothing else, I grieve with him. And I, I'm, I'm never just dis- like when he has that that moment when he goes to Ty Simpkins' character. He's like, "Don't you find me disgusting?" Yeah. And he's just screaming, "Yes, I do." I'm like, "I don't." Right. Which is crazy to say in a movie that features a 600 pound man that has sores all over his body, and he says mold growing in his flaps and everything. I don't find him disgusting. I, f- I just pity him more than anything else. And I don't know. I when he finally like comes on camera. Mm-hmm. Well, that's actually let me reword that. That's, yeah, that's he, the first thirty seconds. Yeah, of the movie. Say, let, me, yeah, yeah. let me reword that. Let me rephrase <laughs> that. When he finally shows himself to his students, right? It's such a like. I, I I cheer I stand up and cheer for him. I'm like yes, Queen Slay. I, and I, I do think it it all depends on how it's deployed. Like the music doesn't work for me earlier in the movie. When it works for me is the sequence where we are actively watching him trying to kill himself. Yeah, and and the, to. To that point, the music is less, look how gross this is, and it's more, this is a terrifying, you know, breaking point for the character. And, and the reality for so many people. Sure. It is It is very common for people to retreat into food whenever they are they have a traumatic experience to happen to them, for sure. And to say sorry yeah. over and over again. I mean, Brendan Fraser- That's most of his dialogue. Yeah, he spent he spent like a decade apologizing to people for, for literally taking up space and for trying to- you, you know, be heard. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's another, that's another layer that he's bringing to this performance. And I, I guess if you haven't seen The Well, I highly recommend you see it. If nothing else, then to form your own opinion about it. But sure. I will say, if you haven't seen it, the, the basic synopsis is 
Charlie was married and had a daughter mm-hmm. and was a teacher at a, at a college. And he started to have an affair with one of his students, um, a, ma- a, a, a male, mm-hmm. and that broke up their his marriage. And soon after, his uh, his uh, partner, his new partner, uh, was found dead. I don't think they ever specifically say uh, how Alan died, but I mean it's heavily implied suicide. Yeah, it's implied that he jumped off a bridge. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And his sister, who like Charlie, decided to come to Charlie's aid when Charlie started out of grief, overeating and gaining weight, and is now the whale. Mm-hmm. And that's where we start the movie. Is uh, his daughter comes to see him after not seeing him for I think she says ten years. Charlie is again like six hundred pounds. His deceased partner sister Liz is taking care of him, who's a nurse, mm-hmm. and he is a teacher online uh, for literature. And it start the movie starts with him just just the irony of him telling a bunch of students to think and write clearly and persuasively. Mm-hmm. That's how you can effectively communicate. And I'm like, I, I, again, this is the trope that you see in a bunch of movies, which is the lesson. In the English class is always the lesson of the movie. <laughs> One of my favorite tropes. Which is, yeah. it's ironic that he can't do that himself. He right. can't communicate how he feels effectively to his daughter. Well, and to himself. Technically, right before this, the the first thing we see on screen I is. Know, I know. I was going to come back to that. I was just trying to, I was just trying to establish the movie for people. Well, I was going to say for Charlotte and Abe. And I was like, imagine having this movie dedicated to your nieces. <laughs> to Aronofsky's parents. And sure. then right away, it is a 600 pound man jerking off on his couch to gay porn and then having a heart attack. Yeah. And I'm like, boy, that's how I want to go. <laughs> that seems nice. Which I will say, I mean, there's, I mean, that, that scene just bothers me for one reason. There's no way he, he can't reach. Probably not. When we see later on when he's naked in the shower, yeah, there's no way he, he can reach. <laughs> but it's also, it, 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 from the beginning, like it it does feel like the movie is challenging you to like that that is like a statement of intent is like Mm -hmm. we still want you to feel for this person even though we're showing them at a at a dramatic low oh and we should state too that it does uh what a lot of other movies do Mm. is it establishes today is monday oh sure (laughs) and there's there's little date cards that pop up yeah because hong chow uh is uh, (laughs) yeah is is like an old romany woman in a stephen king novel Uh and strokes his cheek and tells him you'll be dead in five days Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. very shakespearean yeah Yeah. (laughs) weird weird like most obscure weird sequel to the ring i've ever seen (laughs) (laughs) it was weird that one of the guys in the porn turned to the screen and said seven days (laughs) (laughs) and hell of a way for this uh this missionary guy to meet charlie sure walking into his home in the middle of a thunderstorm and watching an incredibly overweight guy who was clearly just watching gay porn and jerking off have a heart attack Mm -hmm. (laughs) like wow what a this movie starts right away which i do appreciate (laughs) and we get introduced to Liz, who, you know, comes in and saves him and, you know, says, uh, she, she's his nurse. She checks his, she checks his blood pressure and everything. And she says, being in debt is better than being dead. And I'm like, mmm, debatable. I mean, I, this is, uh, this is the United States after all. This, that line made me so angry. Uh, <laughs> peek behind the curtain. Uh, I was in a car accident last week. Mm-hmm. And as I'm being loaded into the ambulance, literally my, my thought process was I don't want to pay for this ambulance ride. Right. And I literally turned to one of the EMTs and I was like, do you like, is there any way that I can just not take the ambulance? Yep. Can I Uber to the that, hospital? I was just right. going to say no that's chat, why there right. was a shot in Ubers, like a skyrocket <laughs> rocket of people using Ubers to go to the hospital. <laughs> and he goes, he goes, well, you know what we're focused on right now is taking care of you. And I, of course I, I had to bite my tongue. Cause I was almost like, that's not what I fucking asked. <laughs> like, <laughs> you should you should have done it. You should. I, I, mean, I appreciate you cleaning my head wound, but mm-hmm. come on, man. <laughs> so wait, did you take the ambulance? I did take the yeah. ambulance. You bitch. I know. What if you would have got like you just ripped out all the like anything they had attached to you, and you're just like, no, I can't do it. I can't fucking I'm like, do it. Like Elliot in that one scene in ET. Uh-huh. <laughs> She's like, let me out of here. <laughs> so she takes his blood pressure, and mm-hmm. it is 238 over 134. God. Yes. Damn. That's yeah. <laughs> it's insane. That is a that is a stroke like in two seconds. Uh-huh. That's DC's weight over mine. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and then she she says something like, I'm gonna kill you or something like that. He's mm-hmm. like, my internal organs are two feet in at least. And I'm like, oh my god. Yeah, she said she's gonna stab him and he's yeah. like, go ahead. Like, like he basically is like, do it. Yeah, he's like, try me. <laughs> What's gonna yeah. 
Come at me. Two feet. This is not a fun movie. No, it's not. It's not. I mean, <laughs> even when they, even when it's literally Hong Chow tickling Brendan Fraser, it's still not very funny. <laughs> They're so good together, though. They like, are. You can see that the, this. You can see that this is an old argument that they have every day. Mm-hmm. You can see their friendship. Uh, that that little giggle that he gives when she tickles him is so like endearing. It is. Uh, and you're like, oh, okay, I can see why they're friends. It's. I mean, it's just like what I threatened to stab Nathan. Absolutely. <laughs> It's, it's it's so fun. Um, as much as we talk about hey, Nathan. Sadie Singh's character, though, Ellie. Nathan, uh-huh. <laughs> gonna stab you. <laughs> Do it. I just... <laughs> her character is so obviously evil. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I know Charlie says she's not evil. She's evil. <laughs> Jesus. Let's just call a spade a spade. She has a... She has, like, a wild savior complex, for sure. I mean, she she literally yells at one point, I'm the only one who can save him. I really want to talk about that later, but uh, towards the end of the movie, but Liz uh-huh. is so much more a villain in this movie, because think so? the enabling of Charlie sure. is... And, and Hong Chao has agreed to that. She's like... Yes, she's an enabler. Yeah. She wants Charlie around simply to cope with her brother's death since that's the last tangible thing she has of him but oh, yeah. she is killing him faster when she's he's like please and she just gets up and goes and gets a bucket of chicken for him it's- well even even before that like she walks in saves him from the heart attack yeah. uh-huh. and then he's like help me up I have to pee she should no. He should stay there, like set up a bedpan situation. This right. man shouldn't be on his feet because we see we see later that he has one. Yeah, give him, give him a baby aspirin. Yeah, but it, it, they they also have this weird psychic connection because what happens is he says, "Liz, Liz, yeah, please," and yeah. she knows instinctively it's chicken time. Yeah, <laughs> and so she <laughs> walks chicken. to the kitchen to pick up a bucket that we've never seen uh-huh. that is fresh. <laughs> Like I, I was so puzzled by that. Yeah, I mean that's that's the trope of like a fat guy is like the bucket of KFC chicken just on the ready. But also just like wh- what? Yeah, no, it yeah, really shocked me. On this rewatch, mm. everyone in this movie j- is oh, just. I wonder if I can get KFC delivered. <laughs> I was thinking about getting KFC. Honestly, as like the the meal of the film, I just didn't. But <sighs> like, oh, man, a famous bowl right now. Oh, oh boy, <laughs> so good. I just. The whole movie is everyone yelling at Charlie. Yes. And they're all screaming at him, just go to the hospital, just go to the doctor. And I'm like, motherfucker, you all you guys are doing is talking. You're all just talking about getting Charlie help. Uh-huh. You all have the ability to do it. Call someone. Call 911. Baker Act. Once you know he wants to kill himself, Baker Act that yes. with somebody. You, like, you have options, yes. It is your responsibility at that point. Like, he, he basically comes out and tells his wife, I am planning on killing myself so that our daughter can have this money I've been putting away. Uh-huh. That's why I don't go to the hospital. I'm like, you're all complicit. Mm-hmm. You're all complicit in this man's destruction like it's it's gut-wrenching to fucking watch Mm -hmm. like liz getting the bucket of chicken is just the first start of this shit and samantha morton giving a buck wild performance when we get there (laughs) she is on a she is on the stage she's not in in front of a camera (laughs) she's she was possessed by chloe sevigny for like a day (laughs) oh man i can just get a bowl of gravy yeah you could (laughs) you sure you sure fucking could I mean, let's be honest. Best fast food gravy of any place you're going to go. So, Oh, that really tickled me. <laughs> I might get KFC for dinner. Add to cart. <laughs> but this is where we're introduced to the essay that, like, grounds him. Did, right? Okay, so I got to ask because on the first watch, I didn't put it together. But mm-hmm. to me, on the first watch, I th- assumed the essay was written by Alan. Mm. But then on, on the rewatch, I'm like, oh, it's clearly written as like a a a third or fourth grade level like it's not him but mm-hmm. on the first watch i thought that was what they were going for and that's why he was grounding him interesting until the ending where she, ellie re- reads it i'm like oh shit it's hers yeah i i actually had thought it was something that charlie himself had written when he was younger mm, until, okay. until we got to that reveal because i was like oh this is like something that like you know, grounds him and reminds yes. him of you know being a child and and not having any cares. See, I assume I assumed it was the daughters the whole time. Hey, you're smart. Well, let's let's, let's <laughs> not go that far. But <laughs> in other news, KFC is on the way. Hell yeah, brother! <laughs> tell tell them to just drop it in the mailbox for you. <laughs> <laughs> I left a twenty in the mailbox. It's for for as complex of a performance that Brendan Fraser is giving. The character of Charlie is very one dimensional. It's 
I want to provide for my daughter. Mm -hmm. That's it. Like, that is his want. That is his goal. I think... Well, this is a kind of a, I mean, I guess it's a dark story to, sure. you know, talk about anyway. But like when someone makes the decision to kill themselves, they often feel a very uh, real sense of like calm. Mm-hmm. Like they're, they're like, okay, I only have that one more thing to do. Right. And so it's like, like and I think that that's kind of. If if Charlie ever comes off that way, I think that that's really what it is, is he's like, okay, I've decided that this is the goal, yeah. and I've got a week to do it because Hong Chao is psychic. <laughs> it's very reminiscent. I don't know if you get, if you made it this far, uh, Nathan, but in Better Call Saul, there's a whole episode dedicated to that, to a character that oh. felt very real to this. Mm. And you're right, like, they, they cancel their appointments, they, they try to close any open book they can. Yeah. There's a there's a storyline like that in Hannibal as mm-hmm. well, where it's just like this is like the the best thing I could. This is the most noble thing I can do is to be done. And there is, I feel like, especially if you have children, there is a it, it may be an intrusive thought, but there is a fleeting thought of if I die, mm. how well off is my kid going to? I mean, it, I guess it's for anybody that has a will, sure. but specifically if you have young children of like if I die. How well are things going to be? Could there be, could things be better? Could I do, could I up my life insurance more? Could I take another second job? Like, right. And for that to be the laser focus that he's got in this movie. And then for Ellie to show up here in the next scene and just ridicule him, just rip him apart. You'd be disgusting even if you weren't this fat. Yeah. It's, it's brutal. Her dialogue is insane it is and i mean that in like the most but it feels real <laughs> it feels so real for a teenage girl in some ways yeah i in some ways like, yes and no yeah there 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 are moments of such casual cruelty from her character yes. that when samantha when samantha morton finally says she's rotten she's fucking evil yeah. i was like yeah so this lady gets it yeah well okay i agree with that but my defense of it would be from her perspective, mm-hmm. she is, I think they say she's eight years old when they, no, she had to be younger than that, right? When they, when their family divorced? No, she, he's been gone for eight years. She's 17 now. Okay. So, like she, yeah, eight or nine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, eight or nine. So her father walks away mm-hmm. and I'm sure based on Samantha Martin's performance, I'm sure her mother was not kind when speaking about him in front of her. Right. And <laughs> it's been almost a decade. Samantha Morton, who, Smokes a cigarette next to an oxygen tank and says, who, who fucking cares? No, she's, she says, <laughs> I'll go by the window. Right. <laughs> but from Sadie Sink's, from Ellie's perspective, mm-hmm. he broke their family apart because of a, a gay relationship mm-hmm. and then ate himself into oblivion. And then just disappeared. Like, yes. doesn't, yeah, cuts off all contact. Yeah. I get her, I get her resentment and her anger. Oh, no, I think the motivation is there. Sure. I think, I, I think that just some of the dialogue is, is a little clunky. You think it's it's too overwritten? Sometimes, yeah. I, yeah. It's, yeah, when she says it's overwritten uh, and dumb and repetitive, I was like, oh, cool, like, how, how I feel about the scene. <laughs> yes, like, oh, yeah. Well, that's a good, that's a good segue when we start talking about the Bible and, like, she she calls Emerson a worthless f slur, mm-hmm. and I'm like, what? What is what? Yeah, <laughs> what are you doing? I mean, this this is just the the extreme of the angsty teenager, sure. Which I'm fine with again because I feel like I, at least it's somewhat earned with the backstory. But mm-hmm. when the Ty Simpkin character is explaining that he's a missionary and about the Bible and everything, mm-hmm. and he's explaining it to Sadie Sink, and he's like, it's not a cult. And after <laughs> she calls it a cult. And I'm like, if you have to explain that something's not a cult, it's a cult, right? It's definitely a cult. You know, I find it interesting that in the original play, he's a Mormon. Yeah. And they they created this different end times cult. Oh, shit. Is he? Yeah. yeah. And the play is a Mormon in this. He's like an evangelical oh. door-to-door missionary. But he also seems to be a, a Jehovah's Witness based on the uh, the dialogue. Yeah. Which I found very confusing. He's JW coded is what you're saying. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Here's the question for you guys. And this may... This may just be my lack of knowledge when it comes to Jehovah's Witness, but mm. my understanding is they believe that only 144,000 people are getting into heaven, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Why then would they be out trying to recruit more people? <laughs> right? Huh. That's true. Doesn't that seem counterintuitive? Fuck. If the bus is full, you don't say like, I guess I'll give up my seat. <laughs> I've always thought of it. They say it's 144,000 people since Christ died. Since the beginning. Yeah. So. Cream of the crop. What are we doing? Uh-huh. Huh. Why, would you want to keep that a secret? <laughs> I mean, I would. That should be the Illuminati. Son of a 
bitch. I think I just blew Mally's mind. <laughs> what if this causes Mally to start his own religion? <laughs> oh, th- yeah. Yeah, that would be great. He is a big fan of cults. Oh, man. Whoo, kimonos are <laughs> Oh, boy. <laughs> I, I think I might sign up for this religion, <laughs> especially if there's tax deductibles, too. Let's go. <laughs> hey, listen, I'm a, I'm already not paying taxes. So I <laughs> Blade don't pay taxes. They're playing this in your uh, in, in the courtroom. They're playing the deposition. <laughs> in oh, the yeah. deposition. Yeah, yeah, there's, yeah dude, they're going to hear some stuff. <laughs> she tells us if I show a lot of improvement in one subject, I might be able to graduate. And I'm mm-hmm. like, yeah, that old thing. That, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you do well in one subject, well, you get to go to college. There is a good part too. I think it's Charlie who says it when, because uh, he's like, I've already, I know all this stuff. I read the Bible. And he goes, I think God brought me here mm-hmm. to save you. And he goes, I'm not interested in being saved. I'm like, hell yeah, brother. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. great. Speaking of which, have you guys read the Bible? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I've read it. I've read it cover to cover. I like how he's like, I find it incredibly depressing or whatever he's saying. <laughs> There's a Re- there- dude, Revelations. Fuck it. Oh, that shit reads like a crackhead's fever dream. It, it goes hard. Intense. <laughs> no, uh, Pat Oswald has like put it perfectly. He's like, there's like ghost stories uh-huh. and, and monsters and uh, there's, there's action and adventure uh-huh. and incest. George R.R. R. Martin fucking wishes he could. <laughs> <laughs> I just found it so tedious with all the baguettes. I'm like, I don't care how many kids this person had and how many grandkids they had. I don't care. Oh, okay. So you don't like gossip? I don't like the pacing. <laughs> I want the pacing to be smooth. <laughs> Um, it, it, honestly, like the Bible and Dune kind of mm-hmm. have that same thing. We're like, there's just chapters that are just like lists of names. So it's a sprawling uh, epic that spanned several generations, is what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jesus was the OG Kwisatz Haderach. <laughs> uh, do you think uh, Mother Mary was, uh, fuck, what are they called? Uh, fuck, what's Rebecca Ferguson in that movie? Uh, uh, j- uh, a fox? <laughs> no, well, there's that. <laughs> there's that. It's like a. God damn! I should have really remembered. It's the Jesuit, the Bay of Jesuits, whatever. Fuck it. Who cares? Oh, the Benny Benny Jesuit. Oh. This this bit's dead. Fuck it. Move on. <laughs> the old Bay Jesuits. You man, hey, you tried. <laughs> um, I could have done uh, without hearing the names Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, and Donald Trump in this movie. That would have been nice. Yeah, weird choice to set this in 2016, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I was wondering why that would be. I don't know. It, it like it didn't add anything. No, yeah. I think the only thing I read up about it was that they wanted to establish that it was pre-pandemic. Okay, because I mean this was, but that feels like it's an afterthought because right. it started started production before the pa- like the pandemic started. So I don't know. Well, and there was that weird thing at the end of the credits where it said "Proud Boys, stand mm-hmm. by, <laughs> stand stand by." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <sighs> Speaking of which, glad that guy got thirty years in prison. Yes, he did. Yay! Hold on, we'd love to see it. Wait a minute. I haven't used the soundboard in quite some time, uh-huh. so give me a second. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> and then Liz having this conversation with, and I, I didn't catch his name, the missionary guy's character name, but Thomas. Thomas. The tank engine. You know, because he has doubts. Oh, oh my God. God, God damn me. it. <laughs> you can't tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> Don't boo me. <laughs> she says, oh, I'm not booing you. I'm booing just the idea of naming this character Thomas. But uh huh. She says, I am the only one who can help him. I'm like, you're the one killing him actively. Right. You're bringing him two meatball subs and everything? With extra cheese. She bargains with it, too. Uh-huh. She's like, uh, okay, I'll give you this sandwich if you don't invite Ellie over God, again. God, God. And then she she screams at him and says, asks him why he can't chew, like, quote, a normal human being. Exactly. Which, like, tells us how she really feels. And she goes, you could have died right in front of me, like, I, and then implied that she'd have to deal with it again, like her brother's death i'm mm-hmm. like come on which is like look i wouldn't want to relive that either if no I, if but been like through it. he's still a human being sure. like jesus christ yeah i think there is my, my next note is about the the zoom calls yes and i i think those are exceptionally well directed because yeah. i kept thinking about how everyone's reactions are it feels so natural mm-hmm. And indifferent too. They're all they're all going through. Like there's one guy who's just eating cereal. Uh-huh. There's when he when he does the reveal at the end, you can see someone pulling their phone out in the yep. corner. Like yep. it's. I think these are really really well done, dude. The the girl pulling the phone out really upset me. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> totally. I, I'm gonna go to real vi- reveal a little early. My bit part is one of those people. <laughs> me too. So we'll talk about when we get there. Oh, my bit part is. Okay. I, I think I can guess what yours is going to be, but we'll see. The Cheetos? <laughs> oh, hang on, guys. My KFC is here. BRB. Hey. Are you for real? <laughs> this is incredible. That was so fast. <laughs> that is. God, tip that man. 
Or lady. We know from previous episode, The Menu, that Mally tips like a king. Generously. Mm -hmm. I think he says this to Liz, but I could be wrong. He says, Mm. look at me. Who would want me to be a part of their life? He says that to to Ellie whenever she- Oh my God, you're right. That makes it so much worse. Yeah. She's like, why didn't you want me? That's so much worse. And I- that line obliterated me. Yeah. There's a couple of lines in this movie that really just break me into pieces in that one. I hear that bag. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. Can we just appreciate KFC? They really, like, they were like, you know what? We're going to just fucking, we are going to rep the sport so hard. That was mm-hmm. so, fu- was that Uber Eats, DoorDash? What are we doing? Yeah. Grubhub? Don't worry. Don't worry about my business. It's wild <laughs> that they sent you a bag of gravy. <laughs> He's got a KFC direct order. <laughs> 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 Wholesale. I got a guy. We got the colonel shows up. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I I might go get KFC after this. I'm not gonna lie. It's the wave, bro. The reveal. No, the movie's called The Whale. God Boo. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, hey! I'm not gonna get booed on my old show. <laughs> the reveal that Charlie could have avoided mm. all of this because he was able to afford to get the help, but decided to put it all in account for his daughter. I know. It's, ugh. But did he? Because this apartment's like seven bedrooms. <laughs> Is it? I, did, I genuinely did not pay attention to the geography of this room. <laughs> it seems like a big apartment to me, but maybe maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. He's in, what is it, Idaho, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I think I think he says it's like $700 for rent. I think he could fucking afford that shit. <laughs> sure. That's $100 per room. That hit me like a fucking brick, man. <laughs> And yeah, that hit me like a brick. Knowing that that he that he could have gotten that his rent was so cheap, that he could have gotten too. Uh, medical attention. Yeah, and just like that's that's where like the big crux of the movie comes from when it finally tells you like two thirds of the way through, this is all avoidable. Mm-hmm. This is all circumstantial. And this is all all Charlie has to do is go to the hospital, mm-hmm. but he won't because this is the best way he knows to provide for his daughter, who he feels incredibly. Uh, guilty of having wronged mm-hmm. and the fact that after that reveal comes and you know the the mother showing back up and li- like everybody's there and then ellie just screaming at here at him i don't care about you just fucking die already and I'm, it's rough oh yeah again this is not a fun movie guys no, no it's not but and nathan i i give you credence to the point that you say that some of the dialogues overwritten some of it's just completely over the top but that feels real oh some of it is yeah some of it is so blunt because it is honest like that is that is what i mean especially we we do have to reckon with the fact that this is a teenager right and so like a lot of big feelings and not all the words that she needs in order to express them. What if she only talked in like Gen Z slang? <laughs> <laughs> I low key wish you drop dead. <laughs> like dad on God, this is not based fam or something like that. It should be noted. I don't know what I just said. <laughs> She'd have to have that Gen Z haircut though with the, the, the shaved size and then like the poofy hair on top. Oh yeah. The, the Diane word. Hair. Yeah. I legitimately have a Google tab open right now. That's just Gen Z slang. <laughs> Yo, his his blood pressure be busted for real, for real. He's got, <laughs> he's got us in one ear and ice spice in the other. <laughs> On God. On God, son. What the fuck is wrong with this generation? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the the reveal to it. Can we, we can, KFC fucking hitting, though, God. <laughs> we kind of glossed over it, but mm. I, I love that clearly Ellie has strong feelings about her father but mm-hmm. not all of them are negative when she he's like just write me something write anything mm-hmm. and she writes the haiku yeah with, you know that i quoted at the beginning of the movie but uh, that episode but- oh his his excitement is like palpable i i love that moment when he's like he's counting out the syllables right and then when his his ex-wife shows that she posted a picture of him to facebook and mm-hmm. said there will be a grease fire in hell when he burns up that is fucked. It's, so it's fucked. fucked. But his response is what is she's, so fucking amazing. He's like, she's a great writer. He's like, this is honest. He goes, I read essays from people all day long that mm-hmm. is just bullshit. This is honesty. And then it's coupled with that when he goes to his students, he says, fuck the lessons, mm-hmm. fuck the writing prompts. Just tell me something honest. And I'm like, this is what makes this character so it like takes it from a one dimensional aspect to a two dimensional like yeah. at least of like being able to see like when he keeps repeating over and over she's so amazing she's mm-hmm. incredible do and you really think he'd get fired that quickly for that email as a college professor no 
I don't. I was also I was also kind of puzzled by you know how like when they fire you as a teacher, you're allowed to do one more lesson to say goodbye. Well, here's <laughs> here's the thing. I don't think he was fired because in his last phone call with him, he says, "I've heard your complaints that you want another teacher." Oh, is that what oh. it is? And then he says, and then he says, "My replacement's coming." Well, he's yeah, he says that, and he says, and some of you may have seen my message from last night. So mm-hmm. I don't think the message gets him fired. I think what it is is. Because that student at the beginning said, "Is did he get his fucking camera fixed?" Is a lot of them are like, "Hey, we can't even see our teacher." Right? Uh, like, you know, that's interesting. I think that's what it is. Okay. There's a couple of things that are unclear. Like that. Like Liz brings Samantha Morton over. Right. She's like, "I told her that Ellie's been coming over here," but Samantha Morton is aware that Ellie's been posting pictures of him on Facebook. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that what it is is she saw the picture on Facebook, and then Liz confirmed, like, "Yeah, Ellie's been coming over." Okay. You know, I'll buy that. But I mean. Who's to say? Like, who's to say? Um, well, the movie should, I think. That, the movie, the movie, the movie should. <laughs> that, that was. Damn. That is that is so genuine for a teenager to lash out in that way. Of, oh, totally. Just die already. I fucking hate you. Yeah. Just to put up this facade of toughness. Sure. And the fact that Brent, like that Charlie, sees right through it. It's, yeah. And then when you get to the fight that him and his ex-wife had, mm-hmm. and the part of the movie that I think breaks me the hardest, and it is in the full trailer. I think we watched the teaser earlier, not the full trailer. Mm-hmm. DC, you had one job, and it was pull the trailer. <laughs> I know. I, I fully cop to the idea and the uh, insinuation that this movie is emotional manipulation. Mm-hmm. I fully embrace that. However, <laughs> it fucking works on me uh-huh. when he's having his fight with his wife and... I'm going to fucking choke up saying it, but when Brendan Fraser turns in his wheelchair to his ex-wife and says, I need to know yeah. that I have done one thing right in my life. Mm. I, I just... Again, <laughs> the performance is unassailable. I think he, I think he's on, he's haunting in this scene. He's panicking that everyone's leaving him. He, yeah, no, he's great. The score swelling right at that moment. Yeah. And... Again, I see that in the person as well. Oh, yeah. Like, not necessarily the words he's saying, but the way he's saying it. And you saw that when he accepted his Academy Award, yes. like, like crying and, and not really being able to reckon with the fact that people were accepting, yes. not only accepting him, but welcoming him again. Yes. And the Oscar goes to <laughs> Brendan Fazer. So this is what the multiverse looks like. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, I thank the Academy for this honor and for our studio, A24, for making such a bold film. And I'm grateful to Darren Aronofsky for throwing me a creative lifeline and hauling me aboard the good ship, The Whale, that was written by Samuel D. Hunter, who is our lighthouse. <sighs> Gentlemen, you laid your whale-sized hearts bare so that we could see into your souls like no one else could do. And it is my honor to be named alongside you in this category. (laughs) I want to tell you that only whales can swim at the depth of the talent of Hong Chow. And I um, started in this business 30 years ago, and things, they didn't come easily to me, but there, there was a facility that I didn't, uh, I didn't appreciate at the time until it stopped. And I just want to say thank you for this acknowledgement, because... It couldn't be done without my cast. It's, it's, been like, it's been like I've been on a diving expedition on the bottom of the ocean and the air on the line to the surface is on a launch being watched over by some people in my life, like my sons Holden and Leland and Griffin. I love you, Griffy. My manager, Joanne Colonna, Jennifer Plant, and my best first mate, Jeannie. 
Thank you again, each one and all. I'm so grateful to you. Good night. I mean, again, a lot of the people in that audience are fucking hypocrites. Because right. Where, where were they for the 10 years he was trying to come back? But uh, yeah, it's perfect that you mentioned that because that's exactly what I started thinking about, too, is this this man mm-hmm. has been through hell and back yeah. both in his real life and as his character. And to for him to, to say those words, mm-hmm. it does resonate me, with me in terms of his personal life. I obviously don't know the guy. I don't know if that's really how he feels or if he's just channeling all that into there. But I've, like you said, when he finally got up there and, and accepted that Oscar mm-hmm. and could not articulate and was clearly like, almost like, um, God damn it, I can't even remember how to pronounce his name. The the guy who won for Everything Everywhere all at once. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. It was a good night for, for grown men crying. I felt yes. very seen. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but for people that fought, that deserved it to finally get it, like, yeah. there is something in that representation in this character mm-hmm. and, and something in the person playing that character that is so... Re- like, we haven't actually done the movie on the show, surprisingly, at this point, but I felt that way... When I first saw Jennifer Lawrence in Silver Linings Playbook. Oh, sure. When she confronts Bradley Cooper in the streets there. Like, I feel... Cooper in the streets. <laughs> that, <laughs> that there is... There is something... Boo. There is something in that performance that a lot of actors can't get to. Well, it's it's genuine catharsis, right? It is. Like, it's... It, you, he's exercising his own demons in this movie. And I, I don't know, man. Just hearing Brendan Fraser's voice crack, mm-hmm. it breaks me into pieces. I can't fucking do it. I can't handle it. No, I, I, he's, he's phenomenal in this and I'm still, and, and it, it says something about his performance that he was able to hook me again because the scene before this, I think is the angriest I was during the movie mm. because I, I wrote, de- it's when Ellie is like threatening Thomas with this, that, and the other. Oh my God. Yes. And I wrote, what the fuck is this cartoon goblins problem? <laughs> when she's recording him under the door, confessing to stealing the money from the church. She, she threatens to tell the cops that he assaulted her. Yes. She threatens to murder her father in front of him if he doesn't smoke weed. Like Not only that, photographs him taking weed, gives her biological father an Ambien cocktail, right. almost kills him, yeah. and then when Liz confronts him and says, if you had the wrong dosage here, you could have killed him. She goes, like, but I, I didn't. didn't. Teenagers, <laughs> man. Teenagers. That's what I'm saying. Right. I think, so relatable. I think she may be the worst character I think she may be the worst character we've ever covered on the show. Like, <laughs> genuinely. It's one of the worst. That being said, though, I mean, Sadie Sink is good in this role. Amazing. Amazing. But she's, like, the only Stranger Things cast member to do, like, good stuff. To right? actually get a career so far, it seems. Yeah. yeah. Cause I haven't, those other kids, I haven't seen them in anything good. Right. <laughs> Not really. I think that's the curse of childhood acting, though. Yeah. She has moments that feel like I'm watching a play, but yeah. I think that's just because of the way it's written. And I also think, I don't mean to be a dick, like, I guess I am, but like, <laughs> Ty Simpkins, I think, drags people down around him. A little bit. <laughs> There's moments where he, he will, like, you know, slam something down and then dramatically, like, turn his back or walk away yeah. in a way that I've seen in... Yep. I can't tell you how many acting classes. <laughs> to be fair, <laughs> Samantha Morton hits the wall pretty hard for me oh, whenever, yeah. right after Charlie says, I need to know I've done one good thing in my life. And she goes, with her back turned to him, she goes, we both played our parts. Uh-huh. Like, that is such a play <laughs> line reading. Like, I, It's not without its flaws, this movie. I just don't think 64% is a fair assessment. Sure. So, that's me. But I, I, think, I, I think this scene, though, like that you're talking about is is maybe one of the most complex like in terms of character motivations and, and dialogue. I mean, when 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 Liz melts down over finding out that he has the money, right? Yeah. She lists two things that she could have done, like that he could have done for himself and then goes to the selfish thing third, right? Yep. Like my car broke down, yep. you know. I I think it's, I don't know, I, I, I love... I love that she has to like get in that dig where she's just like, I, you know, do you know how much I've fucking given up for you? To be fair, I do think it's unfair to the character of Liz to not be forthcoming with some of that information because she. Oh, 100%. She, uh, yeah. She has 
put her life on hold mm-hmm. to cling on to this thing that is Charlie that is keeping her brother alive. Well, and she's, you know, she's a nurse, so she's leaving, you know, a 17 hour shift yeah. to check in on him, yeah. you know. And then who knows, you know, how easily it could be for her to come to his apartment and then he's dead already. Right. Absolutely. She's putting that up every time she opens that door. So, like, it is a very complex scene. And you're right. Everyone is just shouting and angry at Charlie. But, but then. When Samantha Morton sits down and lays her head on his chest oh. and they talk about the beach, oh. I wrote, this is this is genuine humanity. And it, it that was the first moment in the movie that like j- like really got me. Like the that that sort of the 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 pit the fever pitch of him panicking. Yeah. And then them having a quiet moment where they are just people yeah. <laughs> to one another. I just wish earlier on there was a little bit more of the beach shots like of his feet in the water just mm-hmm. to really build that up but yeah. i agree when when she breaks down in his in his and then he goes you know i think that was the first time in nine years we've all been in the same room together uh, yeah is, oh it's good stuff and then that goes right into uh the binge eating scene sure hmm. which is one of the hardest things to watch <laughs> i mean he's putting lunch meat and ranch dressing on pizza Ugh. he's making just chip sandwiches potato chip sandwiches with grape jelly with grape jelly and puking in a trash bag. I wrote down, this is an endurance test. It is. Like, I... Because <laughs> you almost expect that to be the movie when you're watching it. Yo, low-key, the, low key though, a ham and egg sandwich with a little hint of grape jelly. <laughs> goes pretty hard. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> and then, it does! Is that what you got? Is that what you ordered? <laughs> <laughs> from, from fucking KFC. No, no, I got me a famous bowl and nice. I, I killed that already. Uh, back in my, when I used to work on set, I used to have to get breakfast for the actors and mm-hmm. a rather, I learned learned of that sandwich from a rather large big name actor okay he ate it every single morning until i tried it one day i was like oh my god this is amazing ham and egg with grape jelly yeah that's not, I interesting can see it. i can see it all right not a lot yeah just a touch yeah for sure that's so crazy that peter o'toole ordered that <laughs> <laughs> dolph lundgren oh my god i do think <laughs> i must the, eat you the, the <laughs> it was also on a bagel oh that I don't, mm, Okay. I don't know. Like an everything bagel, plain? What, what are we talking uh, here? Plain. Toasted. Dustin keeps checking the time. I know. I keep <laughs> trying to move forward. Um, what What I will say, this is comes, the binge eating scene comes right after this kind of recurring bit with the pizza delivery man where he finally sees uh, Charlie. God, I have the fucking, I got the fucking gravy sweats now. <laughs> the gravy sweats? Oh. I, look, if my pizza delivery man insisted four times in a row to introduce himself to me, I'd stop ordering from that pizza place. <laughs> uh, look, I'm, I'm calling, I'm calling his boss. I'm like, I don't, this guy has a pro, like, I would do the same thing if I got a text from an Uber driver uh-huh. after he dropped me off. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. <laughs> but I just naturally don't trust anyone. I think the part of this movie, though, specifically with Ellie, that makes me the angriest is her inadvertently helping Thomas with his family mm. feels like this character getting off way too easily. It, I yeah, I don't buy for a second that she thought she was nope. helping. I truly nope. don't. Nope. I, nope. But I, I buy that Charlie believes or has convinced himself that that's what she was doing. Did you guys find that every time <laughs> Thomas entered the movie it was shot like when michael myers is behind annie in the laundry room <laughs> like, i was gonna say he enters the house every time like he's fucking kramer like he whips the door <laughs> open no but you see his like shadow every single time yes. like in the background yeah, of the i jump behind the wheel now i'm driving the bus <laughs> 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 but but even like i mentioned earlier like charlie never gave me angry even when thomas is Alluding to the idea that Alan died because he turned his back on God by being in a gay relationship. Right. And Charlie not taking that bait and instead challenging it. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I love this character so much. But I'm also like, I'm sorry, this doesn't work out for this kid in real life. He, he, no. goes, he goes back to his parents and, and they, they beat, beat the shit out of him. Yeah. yeah. They beat the shit out of him. Absolutely. And he probably gets... uh arrested from the for stealing the money from the church absolutely like, without question and when ty simpkins yells at him it is i think the worst line delivery in the movie yeah 
You think so? It's pretty rough. Yeah. I don't know. There was just something very like, and now I'm acting about yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think he's also overly, uh, it's, it's easy to overanalyze his performance when he's surrounded by Brendan Fraser and uh, Hong Chow. Sure. Like, sure. You know, it's it's very difficult to stand up. No, it's a, it's an it's an incredible ensemble cast yeah. that just like, yeah, has a, you know, they always have to have like a weird uh, weak link in it, I guess. Mm-hmm. What, what do you, what did Dan want? the pizza guy like what i i mean that, that moment just is so puzzling to me where he just I think like it's just curiosity yeah, and then sure. when he found when it's i think he had already assumed that and then when he got the actual reveal of how bad it was it was just too much for him maybe like i think it is i think if you're bringing pieces to someone almost every day yeah and there's one probably one car in the driveway if any mm-hmm. you know you have to be a little speculative and then like to finally and, and the, especially when they won't even answer the door they're putting money in the mailbox or whatever mm-hmm. and they're Waiting till you leave to take the pizza. I feel like it's just genuine curiosity. And I feel like sure. he is kind of uh, emblematic of how everyday people see uh, larger fat people, you know, like sure. we kind of gawk, you know? Well, I mean, and that's, that's why, I mean, he, he's emblematic of why Charlie doesn't want to leave the house yeah, or I mean, like, you know, e- even if he could. Because that's what he would get everywhere he goes. It's yeah. also just, it, he sticks out to me because he's the one character that like Charlie never really gets to impart any kind of positivity to at the end. Well, I think that's intentional. Yeah. Because it, you, you, you can't have this one-on-one connection with everybody you see in your day-to-day life. So sure. therefore, that's what the majority of people are going to take away. They're going to be judgmental. Same with the students. Mm-hmm. Like there are some that gawk. There's that pull their phones out there's some that seem unfazed by it mm-hmm. so you know i think that's an intentional choice and he's like the not the audience surrogate but the world surrogate i guess right the one moment where i'm not with charlie mm-hmm. is putting ranch and lunch meat on pizza because i no thank you <laughs> yeah, no, no yep that's the one but i did write the ranch and chip jelly sandwich is this movie's version of the last match and the wrestler i was gonna <laughs> say like, it's emblematic of the uh cheese it casserole from paranormal activity sure, too but i hear sure. you <laughs> I forgot about that. Uh, I never made that. I almost did. Ugh. No, I, now coming from KFC, by the he, way. The <laughs> he he kind of makes the decision to traumatize his daughter one last time. You think so? Which in what scene? By by insisting that she stay there while he dies in front of her. Oh, like, okay. Well, well that's, yeah. oh, that's actually a good segue to get me to the end of the movie here. So I'll, I'll do a brief recap. So because I don't know if you've been watching the time DC, I, but. I haven't even looked at it once. <laughs> uh, so. As Liz predicted, <laughs> Charlie is going to die today. As has been written, seven days. He has got like a fog brain and he, he says to Liz in another gut wrenching line of dialogue, which is, don't you think that people are incapable of feeling? Yeah. Just implying just the world over, like people put out this facade of anger and, mm-hmm. and they, they don't care, but they're incapable of not caring. Mm-hmm. And then his daughter shows up and Liz pointedly says to Ellie, who says, what's going on? She says he's dying. Yeah. (laughs) And Liz says her goodbyes. Mm -hmm. Um, What were you going to say, Nathan? You seem like you're about to say something. Oh, I was just like, there's a weird choice to do like a a, a sunshine sound effect. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Every time the door opens, Mm -hmm. it it was just very odd to me. I don't know. So Liz says her goodbyes to to Charlie Mm -hmm. and he's there with Ellie. He, He asked Ellie to read the essay to him Mm -hmm. she realizes it's it's her essay Mm -hmm. uh that she had written a long time ago that he uses to ground himself and earlier on in the movie she asked him to stand up and walk over to him across across uh, to her across the room without the help of his walker and he failed so as she's reading this essay and as he is actively dying he manages to stand from the couch stand up straight without the help of his walker walk over to her she uh she smiles at him he smiles at her he begins to uh ascend from the ground huh? and a flash of white cut to a shot of the beach which he had described earlier as one of his last times with his daughter and then we uh fade to black mm-hmm. what i want to say though is i didn't hear this line on the first time watching this movie and on the second time it damn near killed me which is as ellie is you know telling you know, uh, Charlie, uh, for the thousandth time, I don't want to be here. I don't I don't care about you. And she goes to leave. Yeah. And he asks her to stay. She says, Daddy, please. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that mm-hmm. got me. And I <laughs> fucking wrecked me. Dude. It's it's her best moment in the film yeah. to me. And and it's, uh, forgot, we've got to mention this. I wanted to bring this up earlier, but Sadie Sink mm-hmm. had no idea who Brendan Fraser was when making this movie. What? That's wild. Had no semblance of the hardships he endured. Just thought he was another actor that she had never worked with. I mean, The Mummy came out like three years before she was born. Exactly. So <laughs> I, I get it. That checks out. 
God. But to not know that and uh-huh. then to still turn in this performance and their, their chemistry together is incredible. Yeah, absolutely. And then, yeah, just watching Charlie stand one last time and the footsteps mm-hmm. on the shoreline and the score swelling, the smile he finally gets from his daughter. Uh-huh. It's a it's a perfect fucking ending. It's perfect. Well, I've. I, you can disagree. You can disagree. That's fine. Well, it, for me, I like. I think the the last few moments are they're they're a little odd, but I think it's an it's a it's a nice emotional like resolution there. Sure. What was what I took issue with was as she's reading this essay, we literally see the like him stand up. As she says, he's just a poor big animal. Yep. Yeah. And I'm like, what are we doing, guys? Like, what the fuck? Okay, I'll challenge you on that. Uh-huh. Because that happens early in the movie when he's reading the essay to himself, too, is I think he sees himself at that moment. Mm-hmm. And let's be clear, he's dying at the end of this movie. Sure, yes. Like, that's his death. And I think that's just emblematic of his experience in these past couple of years as he is this big animal as he has seen from, that, I mean, that goes back to Dan, the the pizza delivery guy. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I think her smile, her finally opening up to him and accepting him is, you know, that's at, right after that smile is when he starts to levitate off the ground. Mm-hmm. I think that's him finally making that connection with her and realizing he's not some big animal, you know? Mm-hmm. And then, of course, we can always have the debate of, does he actually get up from the couch or does he die right there? And this is just him imagining things. We, we can always talk about that, but- right. I think he does. I think he does get up. He and he, he just passes out right there in front of her and dies. But that's my head cannon. Sure, and that's why I, I I take your point. I guess, and I maybe I can't articulate how I feel about that line, mm-hmm. but I think also you can see in her face when he does stand up as she's saying that line. She's kind of taken aback of like, yeah, she's saying these words, but it's not necessarily what she feels. Right. So no, I I. I see what you're saying. Mm-hmm. I think it's just it's it's the it, it's the it's the hitting me over the head with it that I oh the, yeah the, that I think is what I'm responding negatively to. Sure, but I do. I think the the emotional arc of him telling her like this is the best essay I've ever read yeah. and like it it being sort of a proof of connection mm-hmm. for her. I I think is really fascinating. But I, yeah, I just kept. I kept coming back to like, okay, so like, what's if he does stand up? What's the next thing? Is he collapses dead right in front of her? And yeah. like, how is that? How how was he doing anything for her in that moment? You know what I mean? Yeah, I think they both knew he was gonna die right there. Sure, and I don't think the money is necessarily on the forefront of her mind. I think she's finally connected with him, and mm-hmm. I think that's all. Right. I think w- once he gets that smile from her, he's like, okay, I can die now. Like, you know what I mean? I right. think he's finally come to terms with that. I think she has too. I think when he first offers her, like, I'll pay you money just to spend time with me. That's her for that. The forefront of her mind. That's the main focus. Right. And then as the movie goes on, obviously, it's the, it's, I think it's the furthest thing from her mind when it actually happens. But I hear you. I hear your complaints. I get it in terms of the movie, but I, I, th- I don't know. For me, it's just like I, I've been in, I've been in the room when a family members have passed and like, mm-hmm. I can't imagine one of them being like, no, I want you to fucking see this. That's fair. <laughs> you, know I mean? you fucking what? Right. <laughs> that's, that's fair. Any last words before we get into prop cop, fellas? Whale, what a picture. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get into prop cop. I actually have to change my prop cop from what I originally wrote down. Oh. So prop cop... For those who are uh, new to the program, mm-hmm. is where we look at all of the props in the movie The Whale, uh-huh. and we take one each for ourselves, of course, hypothetically, unless you want to just break into, I don't know, A24's uh, prop closet. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys got? Uh, Nate, uh, Mally, you said you had to uh, change yours last minute, so why don't you tell us what you decided on? Well, it should be noted I was hungry when I wrote my notes down, uh-huh. so originally it was going to be the bucket of fried chicken, but of since, I, since I got my KFC, mm-hmm. I'm now going to go with uh, the apartment. There the you go. Apartment. All right. Yeah, bro. But just seven rooms. <laughs> I really don't think there was seven rooms, but I'll take your guys' work. There's not. It. There's not. But it looks big. It looks big to me. Hey, that's what she said. Nathan, hey. what is your prop cop? I mean, if you count the dining room area away from the living room. Sure. Then, you know, and then the kitchen. I got seven rooms, but not seven bedrooms. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The bedroom and the two, and, you know, it's at least two baths. <laughs> Nathan, what you got? Uh, during the, the scene with Samantha Morton, you can see on his 
refrigerator that there are tickets to see a production of the tempest <laughs> i'm assuming he's not gonna go and i love some shakespeare so <laughs> i'll take those probably not gonna go um i went with uh his water bottle that says the family fun fair oh, that I missed he has. That. it's like a nice it's like a gallon water bottle that's on his little end table <laughs> nice <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I want a family fun fair water bottle. <laughs> All right, let's go into bit parts, mm-hmm. which is uh, very difficult for this movie because there's not a whole lot of extra roles. I think every character in this movie is named. Uh, but bit part is where we try to recast someone in the movie, preferably a non-named character, as one of ourselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll go ahead and tell you mine. I want to be Henry, who is one of the students that's on cam, uh, that's in the Zoom call, but he is not on camera. Oh. So he is, he's like leading off camera. You can only see like his shoulder. And I'm like, that, that seems right. I want to do that. That's good. Uh, what about you, Nathan? Uh, I want to be David, the kid eating cereal during nice. the second class scene. Nice. Like, I just want a nice bowl of cereal. All right. Mally, what about you? So I didn't think about <laughs> picking the students. Uh-huh. Okay. And that just dawned on me when you guys mentioned it that we probably could have picked one of them. Uh-huh. So the only options I thought there were were the two dudes just railing each other. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, no. Wait, wait, wait. wait let wait, me wait, tell wait. you. Here's the ultimate question. Given or receiving? Oh, I'm giving it to Nathan. There, okay, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I legitimately, because I, I looked on IMDb and I'm like, oh, there's only like five credited actors in this movie. <laughs> and so when the movie started, I sa- I wrote down, okay, well, here's here's me and Mally. Like, I got our bit parts. <laughs> I mean, I guess you could technically you could technically be the bus driver that drops Ellie off in the very first oh, sure. shot of the movie. Right. So there's that. You don't have to <laughs> to be in the adult entertainment industry. It pays better. It probably <laughs> does. <laughs> now for the first time for season seven, mm-hmm. we're gonna talk about the silver lining to La Well. <laughs> or I guess El Well. What's the Spanish word for well? I don't know. I don't know. All right, I'll go ahead and give you mine. Mm. I had a couple, but I feel like I just want to go with uh, the obvious one because it's the one that I felt most resonant Mm -hmm. uh, with me after the end of the movie, and that is just that Charlie redeemed himself. Mm. Again, maybe redeemed is not the proper word, but I feel like there was this perception of Charlie from all these outside people, and I feel like they finally got to, in his last days, really get to know him and appreciate him. And I feel like I choose to believe that he does get off that couch, he does walk over to her, and uh, probably just collapses right there in front of her. But right. I do think she asked him to walk over to her in the beginning of the movie, and he finally was able to do it by the end. And I think that is the silver lining for me. But didn't she ask him that to humiliate him? <laughs> she did. She did. Or she was purely just testing his his willpower. Like, sure. how much do you really want this connection, you know? I don't know. But uh, he, he he was able to do it. So, And I, I, like I said, I think that smile at the end from her is, is the sign that she's... Maybe not forgiven him, but they've they've reconnected him. Accepting him, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Mally, what's your silver lining? Uh, well, technically, he hadn't been replaced as their teacher yet, mm-hmm. so those students probably got an automatic pass <laughs> since their teacher <laughs> died midterm. They probably did. <laughs> That's that really a good. good point. They probably did. Nathan, what about you? Uh, yeah, so Thomas went back home and probably went to jail. <laughs> he probably did. Probably did. Seems more of a Mally answer, but I'll give it to you. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> well, that's the silver linings we have for The Whale. Mm-hmm. Now, every movie we do on the show, we always like to give you an alternative movie, a double feature, a pick-me-up, if you will, mm-hmm. that pairs nicely with The Whale, or just, well, I guess, whatever the movie is of the week. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll stick with that the rest of the season. <laughs> but every movie has to be an alternative to The Whale. So, uh, what would what, what should our audience double feature so the reason i picked big fish was <laughs> <laughs> what do we want to pair with the whale nathan what do you got it's actually a mammal <laughs> um i had another movie about a missionary who's not quite what he seems mm. orgasmo okay <laughs> <laughs> okay all right mally what do you got mm, don't fuck the baby <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, now Book of Mormon stuck in my head. Uh, I'm going with another film about a dysfunctional family where someone tries to kill themselves. <gasps> the Royal Tenenbaum. Oh, okay. Gosh, I just rewatched that. It's so good. Same. I watched it in a cemetery last night. Wow. wow. Oh, that's the Hollywood Cemetery? Yeah. yeah. What a place to watch it. Uh, I went with The Meg. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> 
I've just, I've look, I get it. The joke is easy. The, Bold. The joke is easy to make, but <laughs> it's right there. You got to do it. I thought I was pushing it with Big Fish. <laughs> sure. The Meg, the Meg's a dumb, stupid, funny movie. Why, you need to take your mind off of this uh, really emotional uh, roller coaster you go through with this. And I, I would be remiss mm. if I didn't mention the movie that uh, my lovely betrothed Priscilla recommended as mm. her pick me up, <laughs> Speed Two Cruise Control, <laughs> like. The, the the amount the the quickness the speed that she spit this out when I asked her what would her be alternative was was incredible but mm. she said super size me oh Jesus. wow <laughs> I just I, I was honestly impressed I was like god damn it okay Golly. that's upsetting <laughs> oh sorry you know what the only thing that would have made the Meg better was if uh, Seth MacFarlane was in it and said shut up the Meg <laughs> <laughs> all right I'm gonna go to bed. <laughs> Stupid. Stupid. Who is man? Stupid. <laughs> shut up, the Meg. <laughs> I think you got to cheer and a boo this episode. And you shut up, booers. <laughs> that's fine. I'll take it. It evens out. Okay. I think that's all we have to say on about the whale, except for one last thing, which is, do we recommend it? I, I think you nailed it earlier where I think folks should watch it to make up their own opinion about it. Mm-hmm. I This was another one where while discussing it, there are things that sort of were illuminated for me. I ultimately did not enjoy my time watching this film, but sure. I do think it is full of fantastic performances that are hamstrung by a, a script that's a bit clunky to me. Okay. McClunky, if you will. A McClunky, that's fair. God damn it. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, it's 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 an underrated classic. Um, it's got everything you could ask for. You won't be disappointed. Oh, boy. on the Meg still? Um, I mean, gravy, mashed potatoes, <laughs> chicken. I mean, just the famous Ooh. bowl. That's a 10 out of 10 all around. This is his Yelp review right here. Right. I would also recommend looking up Patton Oswalt's routine about the famous bowl because it's <laughs> great. Okay. That's a good double feature. I've said my piece on this, but I will say one last time. I think without question, this is an all-time performance from Brendan Fraser. Sure. I do not care what people say about this movie. And... <laughs> I think okay. that. <laughs> well, I fuck. I didn't have to be here. I guess. Well, I, I just mean I don't care. I don't care about people that just dismiss it right offhand. Oh, totally. All right. We'll see y'all next week. Yeah. I think Brendan is giving more in this performance than most actors do in their entire career. Mm-hmm. I think Aronofsky took this very sappy and emotionally manipulative story and made it something unique and incredible. I think the score, the pacing, the direction, the performances, the lack of light and color Mm -hmm. to accentuate this story brings everything together in a way that i honestly haven't felt since buried oh Oh, i don't think this movie is as good as buried to me but i feel a lot of the same feelings i felt watching that movie with this one Mm -hmm. and that's the second watch this time for the podcast confirmed it for me like this is a masterpiece right on yes it has flaws but every masterpiece has flaws so that is how I feel about the whale. Whale, whale, whale. Well, whale, whale. <laughs> Listener, if you haven't already, please, we ask that you subscribe to our show. Leave us uh, a rating uh, in your uh, podcast aggregator and uh, leave us some feedback if you would. Uh, if you haven't already, you can follow us on social media. We are on Twitter because I refuse to call it X. Uh, we are on Instagram and TikTok. X. Oh, damn it. I should call it X. That is a very good point. I should bring it back. Um, no, no, absolutely should not. <laughs> and uh, we have a subreddit. Uh, reddit.com slash r slash silver linings playlist where you can get a whole plethora of information about our show. And uh, yeah, if you have a suggestion for a movie you think we should cover on the show, you can email us at the silver linings playlist at gmail.com as well as your feedback on how you feel about this movie Mm -hmm. we do have an episode we are doing this season that is a fan suggestion uh it's one of my picks we'll get to it later this season so it does happen huh and yeah the only thing i have left to uh, offer you all is a clue for what we're going to be talking about next week (laughs) next week we're starting our annual well, I guess it's not annual because we don't do it every season, but now we're doing it every season. Mm-hmm. Our annual Spooky Linings playlist. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be the first week of October, so we're going to hit you with nothing but horror movies for all of this month. And uh, I'm the first pick for our first uh, Spooky Linings episode, so I will tell you my clue. I am the eldest boy. <laughs> my clue <laughs> for next week is Save Your Servants. And your carps. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out what that is next week. But fellas, I think this is a good start to the season. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, nothing but downhill from here. <laughs> so lower your expectations. <laughs> Rest in peace, oatmeal. And I guess Charlie. <laughs> and uh, as always, 
Excelsior. Fuck, did I get gravy on my keyboard? <laughs> People are amazing. Excelsior! 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 Oh. Look it up! up another fantastic episode of the Silver Linings Playlist. If you would be so kind, we ask that you leave us some feedback on how we did, plus a like and subscribe. We'll be back next week with another great episode. See ya!